You've joined the Beat Your Max Video Club, rewinding back to our favourite films of the 1980s. My name's Rich Nelson, and tonight I've rented the Garbage Pal Kids movie. Watching it with me is Ben Baker, who can be found at Ben Baker Books and author of the new book, Killed Your Television. Hi, Ben. How are you? Uh, right. You said favourite there. I'm going to stop you right now. Uh, I don't want anyone listening to this thinking I am a fan of the film we're about to talk about, or in any way condone it, <laughs> or any of the people within it. <laughs> But uh, but I mean, I initially uh, when I wanted to do this, I was going to pick something like Action Jackson or They Live. Uh, but you know what? We'll have a lot of fun with this because we're not watching the film in question. <laughs> no, and for those who haven't seen it, it is. I don't want to put too much of a light on it. This film regularly pops up on the lists of worst film of all time, <laughs> and it's very much deserved. It, it is, and it's not why I picked it. In fact, uh, it was a suggestion by a former uh, podcast guest, Tim Worthington. He said we should do this one <laughs> because he remembers my sheer vitriol <laughs> about it. And, oh, oh boy, it is a film. Oh, yes. Now, I suppose to start with, I mean, this came out in 1987, and what I've been doing on some recent pods is saying some of the director's previous efforts in a way of perhaps providing some some level to their CV. The director of this film, it's, and now I've only picked out two. Two of his films were called Son of Hitler and Where Does It Hurt? Uh, that should explain all you need to know. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, it, it is interesting, actually. It's called Rod Amateur or something like Amateur or something like that. And, and if you if you research him and put TV, you find all these glowing terms because he was a real pioneer in the fifties. He did stuff like uh, Mister Ed and Lassie and the, <laughs> my mother the car, admittedly. But you know, he did all this interesting stuff apparently. But when it came to films, yeah, not so much. No, and one of the earliest, one of the first credits for it is. Um... A Tops chewing gum production. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and obviously this is part of the the history of the Garbage Pail Kids, and that you know they are essentially uh, from chewing gum cards, like the old football cigarette cards, yeah. that sort of thing, but on a completely different world to anything else. Yeah, I mean, I'm assuming these sort of things still exist. We get like a couple of cards, one sticker, might be a shiny, you were hoping to get a good one, and a (laughs) rock-hard bit of bubble gum, which literally took out three of your teeth. I'm I'm assuming these are still out in some way, always in corner shops. And and I guess this is one of those films that, even now, that there has been very muted talk of some sort of reboot, because, you know, we have to find something to plough, don't we? (laughs) Not while there's breath in my body. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and yet even and this is a worrying thing even more well received was a recent documentary called 30 years of trash which was a a fan made documentary about well everything about the film really it was about the cards yeah. the movie the reception yeah. everything since and you know it's bad when a documentary about a film is more popular than the film <laughs> itself i mean it's it, it was a phenomenon if you weren't alive in the 80s I mean, I remember seeing the stickers. Like, I had a friend who had the stickers all over his bedroom door, and they used to freak me out because, uh, as you can probably tell from the title, Garbage Pail Kids is a parody of Cabbage Patch Kids, which was an even bigger phenomenon of the 80s. Those uh, dolls you adopted, basically, weren't they? Sort of early Tamagotchi or Pokemon. (laughs) Very low effort Tamagotchi. (laughs) <laughs> uh, and yeah, so these these stickers came out with all these, you know, grotesque characters. These were like Adam Bomb and stuff like that. You know, they'd be all terrible puns. And just to make things worse, every sticker would have two names as well. So you'd have mm. like Ian Violence, and then it would also be called Steve Murders or something. I mean, that's just off the top head. I don't think they're <laughs> official tops creations. <laughs> I can imagine one called like Clive Bastard or something like that. 
I'm a master of horror. <laughs> and and the film kind of introduces us early as part of the you know the credits. It actually shows us the cards relating to the characters in the film. So there's seven, and I've got a list of the seven garbage pal kids. Mm. Uh, you've got Greaser Greg, who is basically the worst kind of rip off of an Italian stereotype. It, yeah, he is like the worst. He is a, a thug. I mean, he's not a kid for a start. He's a thug. He has a flick knife. <laughs> uh, and he's regularly making sexually inappropriate and incredibly violent gestures, as we'll find out throughout the film. Yeah, and he very much is a woman hater, which uh, just to sort of tell you what sort of world we're supposedly inhabiting. I don't I don't think he's got a Time's Up badge on his leather jacket. No. So we've got him, we've got Messy Tessie, who's a young girl who just snots everywhere. Yeah. Do you remember Gilbert? Uh, Gilbert the earlier from Get Fresh, I do. In fact, I've written about him in my new book, which uh, we'll talk about later on. <laughs> <laughs> Windy Winston. I, I, yeah, I, I, if people are struggling to imagine his power... <laughs> Um, and bear in mind, his card shows a what looks like a mushroom cloud coming out of his ass. <laughs> Foul Phil, which I think has really bad breath and just goes around calling everyone mummy. Yeah, uh, in in the film, he's represented as a baby who goes around asking if people are his mother, and there's no USP to that. I think I think one of the biggest problems which will come up throughout the film is that there were. Well, it's about about fifty or sixty designs to choose from, and you, the foul fill I don't think would have been in anyone's top forty-nine. <laughs> Can imagine he's basically a poorly made model of Phil Mitchell. <laughs> he's, the the next one is Nat Nerd, who's an acne-ridden ginger bespectacled chap who pisses himself constantly. It should be called Peter Piss Pants. <laughs> 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 He is one of the most interesting characters, by which I mean horrific. The nerd element indicates he's probably a teenager, but he's always pissing himself. And then everyone goes, ah, and he goes, oh, come on. As if it was like, (laughs) it's an acceptable thing to be doing. That's a joke you normally get when it's like an eight-year-old in an old person's home, isn't it? Penultimately, uh, Valerie Vomit. Mm. We only see her power once, really, don't we? Yeah, and I think, I think, there's, there's, there's people who come on the, the side of she should be doing it all the time and there's some people who are like, I'm so glad this only happens once. Because you know it's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally and the supposed leader of the group is Alligator who is a uh, is an alligator. Yeah, it, it is. It is an alligator on a, uh, on a midget's body. Uh, and Which, I mean, one of the most grotesque things I've ever seen in a film is Alligator taking out his lunchbox, which is splattered with blood, covered full of eyeballs and toes. And let, let's just remind people: yeah. this is a PG film. In case anyone's thinking this is a a, a leprechaun or troll style horror comedy, it's not. This was very much marketed towards kids and. And I and I remember seeing it as a kid on video with um, my brother, and watching it, thinking, and I mean, it says a lot. Even this came out in eighty seven, so I'd have been what eight. Yeah, even then we were kind of like, you can laugh a little bit at the fart jokes and stuff, but then it's like, what? No, I mean, I know this is an audio medium, but I would encourage everyone listening to go to Google now and type in "garbage well kids movie" and just see mm. the sheer horror of how they actually transfer the Garbage Pail Kids to this big screen. Because it, no, just look at, look at the trailer, that's all you yeah, need. Yeah, I mean, it's basically, I mean, I'd say animatronic heads, but that's, you know, as a disservice to anyone who's ever worked in animatronics ever on midgets. This is difficult because, you know, when you look at IMDb and you see the, the actors who played the kids, you know, they're all dwarves. A lot of them have been in various yeah. that's what they did you know they they got a lot of work in in movies you know most of them played an ewok at some <laughs> yeah. point and even the girl who played messy tessie she was the uh, the one who worked in the bar in total recall oh i never knew that and and things like that you know and, and you just sort of think like jesus how bad is it that mm-hmm. they got work in these animatronic heads that really aren't very good no, no. 
Uh, I mean, incidentally, it's interesting that you mentioned IMDb because I looked up what the score of this is. Oh, yeah. 2.7 out of 10. And that, that's a, there's a sort of margin for error of about 2.6. Well, but bear in mind, like, like movie 43 gets like 5 out of 10. Maybe like 4 point something out of 10. Nothing gets below 4 generally. <laughs> this has got 2.7. So that gives you some idea. It didn't even get nominated for Worst Picture at the Razzies that year. That f- title was won by Leonard Part Six. Yes, well, uh, <clears throat> yes. Uh, let's 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 move on swiftly from. No, no, no. He's been convicted. It's um... yeah, but I, I don't want to know what happened in parts one to five. Is the trouble? <laughs> even Jaws: The Revenge didn't win. Mm. None of these dwarf actors were nominated in the best. Or worst actor. I didn't know the Razzies was actually a thing back then. I didn't know it went back that far. Yeah. I mean, bear in mind, one of the nominees for worst actor that year was Bruce the Shark from Jaws the Revenge. (laughs) It did, however, if I can find it, it did win an award for um, uh, the worst song. This is just an example. (laughs) Really? Uh, I mean, I think we, we, we'll get to that, but there are several, well, there's at least one song in there and several musical cues, but it's not a musical. <laughs> it's not. I think it it's one of these, it aims in a lot of different directions. And I think it's hoping that, you know, had had it been a success, it would have been like, I suppose, a, a comparison more recently would be like South Park the movie or something mm. like that. It falls so short. Yeah. And, and the fact as well that, the director of the film this was the last film before he died the main human actor in the film tony newley tony newley was a big recording star back then uh and he he wrote quite a few uh, musicals and stuff like that seeing him in this is just it it breaks your heart it really does this was also his last film before he died so you do wonder if this film was cursed in more ways than one now one of my one of my earliest memories about Tony Newley was just <laughs> his regular mentions in Derek and Clyde yeah. about it. But even then, yeah. being fully aware of of who he was and to see him pop up in this as you know, the sort of token actor. But you, well, yeah, I mean, let's let let's discuss his role here. It's we- weird. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the, I mean, the film is about Mackenzie Astin's Dodger, who is a bullied kid. And he works hmm. at a, an antique shop run by Captain Manzini, which is Tony Newley's character, who seems to be a magician or a, or a sorcerer, maybe, but <laughs> I don't understand. Basically, he uh, locked himself in isolation in an antique shop because he wasn't happy with the state of the world. Yeah. That it, could be quite easily said in the modern day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's, he's surprisingly heavy in, in a lot of ways, his sort of message. He also has this relationship with the Garbage Pail Kids where he clearly knows them and they know him. We, ne- we, we never discussed that backstory in any way. We don't know how how the Garbage Pail Kids came to be with him. The film begins in space. A flying bin. With a bin <laughs> with rockets on, flying through, and then it crashes into Earth. The boy Dodger, as you mentioned, he's... It opens with him being chased by, and I've just written, I didn't know the character names other than the, the leader of that little gang is called Juice. So he's being chased by Juice's goon and woman who needs a sports bra. She, she's going to have a bad back. So they chase him, um, and he's supposed to be, what, 14, I think? Yeah, somewhere. Um, um, and as you say, Juice, this uh, ridiculous bell end of a supposed villain who. Yeah bullies this kid for his lunch money doesn't say why there's no reason why he's being no 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 Z- zero context at all and then sort of juice tends to sort of fly between local idiot bully and then towards the end of the film it's almost like talking about shipping things over the border and stuff like is he some kind of wanna- wannabe international cartel leader yeah i mean if, to look at him i imagine if he didn't do an episode of Miami Vice as uh, a rich kid gobshite coke dealer, then they were missing a trick. And to be fair, I don't think many other people saw the look because he didn't have a, exactly a stellar career after this. But um, 
I don't think anyone did. <laughs> no. Except for, weirdly enough, one of the voice actors who voiced Greaser Greg, Jim Cummings. Oh, was it? I never yeah. knew that. He's yeah. Winnie the Pooh. His IMDb credits go in, I think there's about 600 different things he's been a voice actor in. Yeah. This is the one that he's most ashamed of. Oh, I do like a party. Come on, Pig. What should happen if you forget about me? Silly old bear. He actually protested against the opening of the film. He was so embarrassed by it. <laughs> it was one of his earliest roles as well. Like, um, And bear in mind, in 2018, there's the Christopher Robin movie coming out at the end of the year. He is the voice of Winnie the Pooh. That's a pretty big gig. Yeah, yeah, this is true. I mean, I say he is. One of the go to. That's why when you mentioned it, it was like, oh, because he was Jesus. He's one of those names that if you know voice people, he is like, mm. he's, up, he's up there with he's the top echelons like Billy West and June Ferrer. Juice's girlfriend, whose name, of course, is Tangerine. Mm. I, I guess her little sister Satsuma wasn't available. Other feed early singles are available. Yeah, Tangerine is. Is is Juicy's girlfriend so naturally the object of Dodger's deepest desires, even though she's clearly about ten years old? <laughs> Apparently, and and again, I, I don't want to keep resorting to IMDb. They were only a year different in age, really, and they dated in real life, which is scary. Oh yeah. my god, that's real. <laughs> oh, well, if anything good came out of this film, <laughs> yeah, Dodger got his end away. I mean, eventually, there's there's a lot of messing about and the. Kids come out of the bin and they start acting. They're very mischievous. They're, they're, and then there's the relationship between them and Captain Manzini. It's almost like something like Willy Wonka and the Oompa Loompas. Or, a subservient. Yeah, you expect him to have a little right. like flute or something like that. Yeah. Tangerine sort of thing is selling cloves at a nightclub. It's, yeah. And it's the sort of shit that you wouldn't see on a market stall in East London. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. now, she sells this stuff to really bad actors outside a nightclub and keeps the money in a little cigar box there isn't an explanation really as to why other than her ambition is to become a fashion designer I, I think we're initially meant to have some sympathy with her because she wants to get out this is clearly a horrible life she goes out with a horrible human being and they live in a very horrible part of town and she clearly wants to break out but as we'll learn, she's also not a nice person and doesn't deserve it in any capacity. She's in a coercive relationship and is being exploited. Yeah. A... yeah. And so naturally the next step is for her to move into the exploiting role. Because Dodger turns up to see her wearing a jacket that makes him look a bit like sort of latter-day Michael Jackson. She sort of asks him where he gets it from and, and all this. It's apparent that or well, he says he designs the clothes himself and she says, Can you get can you make me a dozen outfits by the big fashion show on Friday? So of course we, we know exactly what's gonna happen here. And and she uses her as I say, uh, fair enough if the word here apart, but she does seem way older and she uses her sexuality to basically hoodwink this this fourteen year old boy into going along with her scheme. It's like something out of the in between us. It is. I think at one point he was it when she visited the shop and he sniffed her and just made him look like a really. Yes, he smells her hair. For some reason, it's just like that's. Are we? You're the hero. Mm -hmm. But weirdly, and and maybe Juice wasn't all bad because he he only ever referred to him by the name of Creep. So yeah, he wasn't wasn't wrong there anyway. No, maybe maybe he had some. Intel that we don't see on screen. <laughs> he was actually helping the uh, the neighbourhood from this weird kid who <laughs> spends all his time with an old fella in a dusty old shop. Where within the plot of the film, he gets bathed twice. <laughs> oh, he does, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, in one particular situation, he gets bathed because. Uh, Juice and the bullies drag him into a sewer and and uh, and turn uh, a thing and cover him in human shit. <laughs> There's no getting past that. They d he goes, he like nods to the sewer, and they instantly know as as one. Like this is what we do. We grab the kids. We 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 
bring them into the sewer, pour all the human shit on them. Uh, uh, profit. <laughs> something, something, question about profit. This relationship, because it doesn't explain anything about why uh, Dodger doesn't live, he doesn't well, have a family, doesn't have anything, you know, does he get a school, maybe? We don't even say, no, we don't even say that. He doesn't even have any friends or anything. He's literally just, his world is this shop. And he doesn't freak out, you know, he's the the young, innocent mind who's very open to these seven weird fucking things who live in the basement. He's happy to exploit them and put them to work in their little sweatshop because, uh, it's horribly, because their dwarf actors makes it look like an actual sweatshop, them working away, sewing all these clothes. and Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's worth saying, you say the word uh, sweatshop, they actually go and get the material, they steal the material <laughs> from a building which has a sign up saying, non-union sweatshop. Yeah. I think that's so we're meant to not feel bad about it in any way. Yeah. But still, I, th- I, th- I think you might be over-egging it a bit there, Garbage Will. I think, um, I'm not sure if this is the Garbage Bell Kids or about a documentary about how my latest pair of trainers were produced. But... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, so you don't get that in those, uh, oh, do you know where our stuff comes from? It's made by seven <laughs> grotesque freaks in Anthony Newley's basement. Yeah, you didn't get that on BBC <laughs> Three. Stacey Dooley investigates it. No, oh, but uh, tonight on the one show. <laughs> oh, no. And while they're working away and you've got weirdly foul Phil is in charge of ironing and this, that, and the other, um, they've got their really irritating song, Working With Each Other. Will, will, he, will he be adding a clip of that? Oh, Yes. Why should we do something nice? Let's quit now, that's my advice. We can't do anything by working with each other. I ain't gonna work for free. Tell me what's in this for me. We can't do anything by working with each other. Come on, kids, take a shot. Show them what we really got. We can't do anything. And, and the weird thing is, that isn't the song which was nominated, is it, as no. the worst song? Because <laughs> that's the You Can Be a Garbage Pale Kid theme song. Yeah, if you're three foot six. But in, in this, because they finished what they're doing by really well making the clothes, they decide that they need to have a night out, uh, let off some steam. So... Um, you know, because because of what they are, they can't just go out like themselves, can they? No, no. So naturally, the the outfit is the standard outfit for anyone trying to look inconspicuous, which is berets and long brown coats. <laughs> they look like French art students. I, I believe Valerie Vomit says they should go and see a movie picture, <laughs> which makes you wonder how long they've been in that bloody. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we we know already they're not kids. If Greaser Greg is probably pushing forty, but they go to the cinema and they see well, they sneak round the back. Um, they go and see one of the Three Stooges films. Uh, but as soon as they get into the cinema, they become the most obnoxious people in the world. They steal food. They push people out of the seat. It's reminiscent of my local cinema world. <laughs> Little short bastards running around chucking. This, that, and the other, and although some of it got a bit gropey at one point, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, there is also a lot of un- unnecessary touching, un- un- unrequested yeah. touching, which uh, is immediately foul. Like foul Phil goes, "Oh, I was just checking to see if you were my mum." He, he, he was in nineteen eighty-seven. Not cool, dude. Not cool. You got messy Tessie who walks in and basically sneezes into an oversized bag of popcorn, and it goes everywhere. Yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely sure how that one works. Particularly, <laughs> not all the kids go to the cinema. No, they don't, because um, a couple managed to uh, make their way off for uh, a quick drink. There's a biker bar, naturally, as you'd assume in a kid's property. That is this, and Ali Gare, who we've established at this point eats toes and has a mania for eating toes, continues to eat toes despite the fact it will get him in serious trouble. Guess what happens when he goes in a biker bar? He goes into a biker bar and finds the only biker who wears sandals. Which, I di- again, I didn't think was necessarily a thing that went hand in hand. <laughs> a rumble in shoes, so I say. It's Ali and Windy. They're on a little like quad bike sort of thing, aren't they? Um, mm-hmm. And they have some mechanical issues. And the bar is called the toughest bar in the world. 
<laughs> oh yeah, yeah, that is a like non-union sweatshop. It is <laughs> does it is a Ron Seal name. Just, just to wrap it home, just in case you were thinking, oh, is this, is this a nice wine bar or something like that? <laughs> it's like when you got the Beano and you'd have like <laughs> El Restaurant de Poche. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, the Beano is still a million times more sophisticated than this film. It is, it is indeed. Uh, it does make you wonder why uh, the Bass Street Kids have uh, uh, the Garbage Spiel Kids have had a film, but the Bass Street Kids are still waiting. Come on, Spielbergs, make it happen. Let's let's start a petition. Yeah, come on, Tom Hiddles to the spot. Eh? It's already it's right in itself. <laughs> it's right in itself. Because Ali starts all these these fights and then uh, Windy breaks in breaks in um, is it like something out of like Liam Neeson film sort of takes on all comers. <laughs> I have a specific set of skills. I went to be one skill: farting unpleasantly in public places. <laughs> <laughs> but I will find you. I will shit myself. It will be horrific. I, I will fart so hard your baseball cap flies off. Not taken, more breaking, brackets wind. God. <laughs> no, 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 let's move on. <laughs> oh, I, I'm sure someone can knock that up on Photoshop or something. Yeah, do you know what? It would probably still be more entertaining than <laughs> anything in this film. Juice and his gang, for some reason, are on the roof opposite. So as they come home from their night out and he sees them all, uh, one of the things that we have in the background is that there were a lot of other Garbage Pal kids, of which there are only seven. Yeah, it's, it does imply, like, the entire range of Garbage Pal kids from the cards crash-landed to Earth. And the the kids are checking bins to see if they're in there, as if, you know, like, the just wait but but also they could be in there because i mean the way the kids get out in the first place is that the pail which has been in manzini shop spills over and some ooze comes out and it's never explained whether that ooze is the kids or there's some metamorphosis process it, it's all very very strange <laughs> on top of the oddness already <laughs> Uh, and as you said they are looking for yeah. their friends maybe this was a setup for some kind of uh Garbage Pal Kids Extended Universe. Juice is a shit. Tandrine lets him be a shit. The two bullies are just bullies. <laughs> uh, and Dodge is a horny 14-year-old. Uh, it's, it's all very weird. And uh, indeed, when you look at it like that, actually, with them at least trying to find their friends, the Garbage Pal Kids at least have an impetus to actually, to, you know, a quest throughout the film. Although it's very, very slight. The the fact that the their building that they're looking for ends up being called the state home for the ugly. Yes, this is this is where um, the kid their other friends have turned up at, uh, and it is a building uh, which I say is the state home for the ugly, which brings up a lot of questions in itself. I don't know if if we if we'd go there these days. <laughs> Many ideas, nothing we touch in a modern <laughs> setting. Because, hey, we're all beautiful. <laughs> we are. Not the two child catchers who run around trying to catch kids wearing masks with big yeah. oversized butterfly nets. Yeah, the, the stay home for the ugly, it would seem. Very subtle. Uh, we'll, we'll get onto the residents in a second, but actively try and capture people uh, to be in, in this home. And pay Juice and his yeah. cronies for bringing them our garbage pail pals. Profit? Again, we'll, we'll, we'll work that one out. <laughs> <laughs> because while this is all happening, it's at the same time as the really awfully lame fashion show, the whole reason why Tangerine wanted the, the clothes. It's only when they get there and or when Dodger gets to yeah. the fashion show and he kind of says, like, you used me. Yeah. Kind of suddenly, you can see the penny dropping because Juice is there, and oh, you've double crossed me in this. That was a fucking shot. And she's she's also at this point found out that the kids are making the outfits and banned them from coming. Yeah. Uh, she locks them in, and Dodger kind of goes with it because he's in love with her. And locking children in a basement is never a good idea. In case anyone's taking any parenting tip from this. <laughs> Well, weirdly, on a previous episode, um, I'm going to get you, sucker. My Netflix recommended afterwards that I watch a documentary about Joseph Fritzl. <laughs> I see, I see. The, well, Keenan Ivory Wayne's involved in, <laughs> in that. <laughs> That'd be the torture he made him watch White Chicks over and over again. So, yeah, we've got Wait. this this strange 
stay at home for the ugly. And, and you go in and there's these, not a lot of residents left in these giant dog cages. And do you want to, to tell the nice people at home some of the people who are incarcerated? Well, there's um, Santa Claus. Yeah, who is too fat. I mean, literally, no, it's not me judging before you say that he is on a sign on the cage. Yeah. The the seven garbage pile kids are in a sign that says too gross. Yeah. Um, there's the too hairy guy who looks like someone's just sort of super glued some pubes onto his arms. Yeah. Gandhi is there. Gandhi, yeah. Uh, with, with too skinny. <laughs> so I didn't see the sign for too skinny. I just saw Gandhi. Yeah. And there's, there's a guy with glasses and a tash on who's too weird, who I'm assuming is meant to be Weird Al Yankovic, or a, a parody of Weird Al Yankovic. Uh, okay. I'm not entirely sure. His, his film... Uh, UHF would have come out about a similar time I think. Oh, but the only yeah. difference is that is a magnificent film because <laughs> <laughs> Dodger has, has gone here with Manzini there was one part which was glossed over very quickly when they said oh what about the other kids and they went oh did you see that garbage truck that went past yeah we're too late probably in there the, the indication is that anyone who stays in the home too long is murdered Squashed, squashed, yeah, squashed it yeah. in a in a garbage truck. So the only thing that the only impetus, the only quest there is, is for them to find their friends, and they've failed. And there's still another half an hour of the film at this point. <laughs> so you, I imagine if you were a kid who was really into the range at the time, you'd have been like, "Oh, the other kids, yeah, they're going to get the other kids, yeah, yeah." Oh, they're dead. Maybe there was a version of the toy somewhere where they were just completely flat. Yeah. Is Manzini and Dodger, as you say, find the state home for the ugly. It's like, oh, there could be in there this giant four body building, which is like, like, it seems to be about four blocks away and, and looks like nothing <laughs> else in the urban environment. Like, could they be in there? Just remembered another one in the state at home for the ugly, which people will get upset if, if I don't mention this before we carry on. Someone is too crippled. Oh, fucking hell. <laughs> I didn't even notice. That. Just let us think it. Uh, this was the eighties. Were things that bad? No, I think we've already covered that. The garbage pile kids, Dodger and Manzini, go back to the fashion show. I'm not sure if it's to reclaim their clothes or just to get the upper hand on juice, this, that, and the other. Well, well I mean, let, let's not uh, miss the fact that they get out of jail because their pals, the bikers, return. Oh, yeah, of course. To help yeah. them because in, in the rumble, of course, they all go, these guys got spirit. Bah, 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 have a booze drink on me and as many toes as you want to eat. Uh, so the bikers are now on side, so they do help break them out and rush them. On these ATVs that just seem to keep appearing for some reason. I'm assuming they've been stolen, obviously, but from where? Al- Alan's ATVs across the road is not pictured. So you-, you have to fill in a lot of lines of yourself here. But yeah, as you said, they get to the fashion show. Well, we did see earlier where um, a couple of the kids stole a Pepsi van. They steal a lot of things in this film. <laughs> Yeah, they're um, they're not good kids. Maybe now, like so many, you could go back and s- solve a lot of the pr- these yeah. freakish problems that people supposedly had with just modern advances in medicine. Perhaps um, Windy Winston, he's got his problems, his IBS because he's a uh, maybe he's gluten intolerant or something like that. If he switched to a better, a better diet, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't think this really uh, helping Alligator because. His face is that of an alligator. Foul, foul film. My, my, messy Tessie might get something to clear up her uh, sinus problems. You know, who knows? Yeah, maybe, maybe foul Phil just need, he just needs a nice foster parent. Just putting in that bed with the rest of the ones that got mashed up because he's hideous. <laughs> <laughs> he is. And back to the fashion show. They've all turned up. This is where. Juice is on the phone to someone talking about shipping things over the border to Mexico and, and this, that, and the other. Um, they start invading the stage, and this is where it turns into something like a Benny Hill sketch. Mm. Because, of course, to get their clothes back, they have to rip them off the models. Yes. who who The models are entirely blameless in this. They have been hired... And mm. so while they're getting prepared, Tangerine is a massive bitch to them. <laughs> like, insulting their hair, their look, 
you know, everything about them. And then they finally get on stage to show off these clothes and these things. <laughs> <laughs> you would be in therapy for years. Imagine being stripped to your underwear by Greaser Greg. That's like one of the things from that Gok Wan show where the how to look good naked or something, where they all turn up and do a fashion show in, in a Debenhams in a municipal shopping centre. It should, it should be called How to Look Good in a Big Burning Bin. <laughs> <laughs> this is where um, we finally see Valerie vomiting. Yes. She gets yeah. it over the the two goons, whatever their names are. No, no, no one cares. Co- Cooper Trooper and it's irrelevant. They are the classic movie goons. I mean, the, 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 in many ways, the seventies throwbacks. Yeah. To the to films that always have these kind of flick knife wielding idiots, and, and it goes a lot as far as that one of the goons is the director's son. <laughs> Uh, it's like, who's around, you'll yeah. do. <laughs> who's, who's cheap labour? Eventually, Dodger manages to fight Juice. Fuck's sake. I'm, I'm exasperated just saying these names. But he, he does fight him. Uh, yeah. Really savagely as well. I mean, Dodger starts punching Juice like a man who is legitimately being bullied. You know, and someone finally just snaps and they just punch and punch and punch. And he is, he's... Mackenzie Astin is properly wailing on this dude. Yeah. It's it's not done for laughs at all. Sobbing and like, you've ruined my life. You know, and he has to be dragged away. And it's, bear in mind, this is coming close to the denouement of the film. It doesn't feel like anything's been learned. Solve your problems with life. Weirdly, he's dragged away by Captain Manzini, who... It might be a plot hole that hasn't been explored. It might be him who's ruining his life. You know, he's is this the sort of environment you want Dodger to be growing up in? I mean, throughout this entire film, while Dodger's been on his adventures, Captain Manzini has been trying to come up with a song, hmm. which is to get the garbage pail of kids to go back in the bin. <laughs> because obviously they're not interested in going back in the bin, because why would you? It's a bin. So there's that weird subtext to it as well. But this is the sort of, as you say, the the end of the film where he tries to play this magic song and as long as you play it backwards, they'll be irresistibly attracted to the bin. Mm. Because it's a song that he's obviously emotionally invested in, while he's playing it on his organ, he closes his eyes. Yeah. It's just not even subtle. Again, they just run out the door. And, and jump back on those stolen ATVs. <laughs> <laughs> Having left Dodger, no better off. I mean, uh, the, it's not like they, they've enriched the lives of anyone around them. I mean, the best, the closest thing to uh, an ending is that Tangerine comes back and says, look, I'm really sorry. I acted like a jerk. And Dodger goes, I don't fancy you anymore. You're horrible. And, and that's supposed to be like the yay! Like... Like Rocky winning, nothing seems to have been resolved in any way except more therapy pills. <laughs> well, maybe that is maybe Rocky is the comparison because, of course, he loses at the end, True. and yet he's the True. hero in this way. He he loses the girl, but then also he doesn't really get a lot out of it anyway. I would like to see Rocky versus the garbage pail kids. Well, that'd be weird. Just. I think he could be a good replacement for Greaser Greg, to be honest. <laughs> as long as flick knives aren't permitted. <laughs> oh, One of the, uh, and the last bit where, because Manzini's trying to get him into the, uh, the kids into the bin, he ends up being dragged into the bin himself. Yeah. Uh, well, arse first anyway. <laughs> and of course, that utters the line, I've been stuck in tighter places than this, which suggests maybe this is one of the stories that when he went on his travels or how he got into magic, it would have... You know. I mean, if if anything's been a sell for a your mama joke, then this, this is the ultimate <laughs> case. Well, this is uh, Tony Newley, who's famously married to half the leading ladies mm, of the yeah. era. Yeah, stuck in, stuck in tighter places than a garbage bin. It might as well just say, hey, I'm telling you that I fucked John Collins. <laughs> to be fair, that bin did look like a plaster as radio. Anyway, anyway. Very poor. Been reading, Very poor. Much, been reading too much of his. 
But that was the garbage pail kids. Yeah, so they, they all they all go off into the the night to suggest that there'll be a sequel where they'll have more adventures, which obviously never happened because of sense, reason, decency, and the fact that I will kill everyone involved with them if it happens. This shows perhaps that Hollywood never does re- learn from its mistakes. I mean, how many Transformers films are we at now? <laughs> 37 i believe yeah and yet at least with this they they had the good sense to say you know what let's let's move on i mean you you talked yeah. at the beginning briefly about seeing it as a kid i i mean i i couldn't find any release dates for it over here it came out in as uh in august they came out like at the end of the blockbuster period in 1987 in america in the same week as dirty dancing uh, in in a chart which had uh, I had a, I looked it up in the chart when this film came out, which it didn't even get in the top fifteen. There was RoboCop, Stakeout, The Living Daylights, Lost Boys, Full Metal Jacket, and The Monster Squad, just to give you a flavour of what was about that summer. Uh, but I don't know if it came, I doubt it came out in in the cinema over here. It wasn't released at the cinema here. No, I saw it on I saw it on video. Yeah, I saw it in the. Probably, yeah, early nineties. Yeah, I don't know if it's ever been on TV. If anyone knows if this has been ever been on television, I would bloody severely doubt it. But but then I, I mean, some of the encyclopedias on the internet. I'm, I'm sure I saw a website a couple of weeks ago that detailed every live football match that had ever been shown <laughs> on British TV. Okay, yeah. I'm wondering if this was some. There was something similar for. Uh, the network premiere of certain films. That would be, I don't mean to, if that is a thing, please do email in or, or get us on, on Twitter. Uh, because, yeah, <laughs> I'd love to see that. That'd be fascinating. I'd love to see that the Garbage Pell Kids was probably on at 4am on Channel 5 on a Christmas um, morning. Um, I mean, it has to have been. It, that's <laughs> the only fitting place for something like this. Uh, uh, yeah. And if people are thinking that you know, it's hyperbole and what have you, that I'm just going to say, this is a terrible film and blah, blah. It is not. I promise you, this is like nothing else. I mean, it, there's nothing. There's no, it, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't hang together. There are characters that you don't understand. Some of the most unpleasant animatronics you will ever see uh, in any film ever. And sense of nastiness which pervades throughout the entire film. No, no punches are pulled. This is a, this kid is being beaten up senselessly by these 35-year-olds who should know better. And then his only escape is work, which is in a shop which apparently has no customers ever. His only friends are these <laughs> things that shouldn't exist in the first place, affronts to God's creation. It's not there's a nastiness, and I, you know, admittedly, the cards that it comes from, there was a nastiness to that as well. But it was also a drawing, I guess. So you could just like go, nah, there's no basis in anything. You're not, you're not wondering how those cards are, where their parents are, <laughs> like, like what their school life's like. You know, it, you, it's impossible. <laughs> to dredge any anything of worth out of that. I feel like they had an open, uh, you know, an, an open opportunity with this film to do anything. They could, they, they, you know, there was not, they were not tied into any law or anything. They could have done anything. And what they did was this. Clothes making... <laughs> I can't, there's no words. Uh, it, Rod Amateur, if you had to die <laughs> in 2003, I would come over there and, oh, I would probably kick you in the knackers it's not clever but neither is this film (laughs) (laughs) kill him again 1987 was around the peak time of canon films the excesses that they had and some of the ludicrous movies that came out on their watch i mean comparatively masters of the universe makes perfect sense compared to this i mean it's quite quite similar in certain ways i suppose but again this film came out and and it is deserving of its place in the pantheon of utter shit there is no i would say this film is garbage but that is an insult <laughs> to to garbage it's difficult because you know, there aren't any redeeming features of this film 
no. the characters are well the the garbage pile kids who are supposedly the heroes or anti-heroes are unpleasant horrible things mm. you know even dodger who's supposed to be the sort of plucky hero maybe it's just me i just want to punch him yeah i mean i i, I don't know if there's more if you knew mackenzie astin's work before because i understand it was on uh the fact of life, the sitcom, they spun out of different strokes, which is one of those. Uh, it was set in a girls' school. I remember Sky showing it a lot in in the early days <laughs> of us having satellite, and it was garbage, just just sheer rubbish. But it, at least he was loved, so maybe he had a fan base. Maybe. It, it's Sean Astin's stepbrother, so you know he, he had something going for him there. I understand he's still doing something. I understand he's still working. Well, as long as he's got a job doing something, is I suspect he has a good sense of humour about this film, which you'd have to, <laughs> you know, you <laughs> you really would. I mean, uh, it is a film which it has it has. <laughs> I mean, the title, uh, the post of this is "Out of the Garbage Pail and Into Your Heart," which is of course should be "Out of the Bin and Into Another Fucking Bin." <laughs> that bin's been padlocked and set on fire. That fire will not be put out because this will be kicked into a well. With the Masters of the Universe episode that I did, there was a documentary about the making and, and the sort of cultural reverence of that film. And I, I and how I really wanted to see that. And again, I kind of want to see the documentary about this. Yeah. And it was guys at Sudden Double Deep who recommended it. Um, and I need to try and get hold of a copy. Yeah, but... I, I, I really fancy watching that as well, because it is a phenomenon. Because I've got a copy, uh, I'm, I'm sure, fully legal download of the film. And um, my, my laptop started developing issues after I downloaded it. So uh, perhaps there is a... There is a first, there's a... <laughs> it's literally slimed. <laughs> uh, it's sli- slime started coming out of the side. Slimed from these sides. Oh. <laughs> Shall we move on to a, a more pleasing topic? You've got a new book out called Kill Your Television. I do. Um, do, I do tell, yeah. us, uh, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, well, it's collecting on my writing on TV stuff. Uh, I, I've been writing on and off like 15 years or so. And this is kind of my favourite thing that I've written and a lot of new stuff as well combined. It's, it's stuff that you can't get anywhere else, uh, which is a follow-up to a book I did called Festive Double Issue, which is my look at 40 years of Christmas TV schedules in the UK. There's always a fascination, I think, that people of our generation have with remembering old TV and there's... There's certainly a lot of retro stuff in there, like uh, Alligator's close cousin, Doc Croc, is is featured. Do you remember (laughs) Round the Bend? Yeah. Uh, It's an ITV, CITV sitcom by the Spitting Image team. Uh, I go into that in some detail. There's uh, there's, there's an article about the... I tried to work out which TV themes have been the biggest hit singles, which is really surprisingly hard. But, but needless to say, Simon Cowell has his dirty paws all over that. <laughs> not Zig and Zag, is it? It's not Zig and Zag, no. It is, uh, it's, spoilers, it's the Daily Tubbies. Oh, <laughs> God. Well, um, your book's available on uh, Amazon Kindle, and where, where else can people get it? Uh, benbakerbooks.co.uk is where the print ones are sold. Uh, and if you go on Amazon, type Ben Baker in, or Kill Your Television, or Festive Double Issue, You'd be able to get the Kindle versions there at two ninety nine each. Uh, some of which Amazon even lets me keep. Do they pay tax on it though? This, this will just be bird song. This bit is fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ben, as we've um, as we mentioned earlier, um, you're going to be back in the future to talk about the uh, Carl Weathers masterpiece, Action Jackson. You know what? I um, think I probably may at some point. Uh, give me a few months to uh, wash the stink off of. <laughs> <laughs> who knows yeah I may, yeah i may return and as we and as we already discussed earlier because this film wasn't released in the cinema so there was no number one when it came out i will put in one of the masterpiece songs of the soundtrack play the podcast out with you can blame me afterwards uh you may wish to wash out your ears but um on that bombshell i think after, we can only go up from here ben baker thank you very much for joining us and um we'll see you for the next episode it's a pleasure oh, take care guys, Concentrate on what you do by 
I go down, it's up to you. We can do anything by working with each other. We can do anything by working with each other. We... This podcast is part of Brit Pod Scene, an independent network of uniquely British podcasts that's always growing. Check out BritPodScene.com or BritPodScene on Twitter to find out more. Oh.